Okay. All right, team. So we're going to scoot along with uh, some more stuff here about um, how to allocate facilities, right? So this is the last piece of this uh, kind of optimal supply network story. So we've moved through uh, optimal location of public facilities. We had the cartogram diversion. Uh, and then we looked at uh, how, to, how to set up a, a network, say, at the level of the US to supply these facilities, right? So that was a big redistribution kind of network story. So there's an optimality for that. And Cincinnati was the big central hub. So that was a, a score for Cincinnati. So they should, they should be petitioning Amazon, actually, right? I think Amazon has about 100 places that are trying to, including Puerto Rico, actually, right? So they're all trying to get Amazon to, be, to, to develop a second headquarters. All right, Cincinnati has an argument. OK. All right, uh, and so I'm going to talk about that. I, I have a few little pro things. We talked about Sci-Hub. I'm just going to kind of race through some stuff. Sci-Hub. So this is the person. Um, it's Alexandra. I don't know how to say Al Alabakian. I'm not sure. But Internet Pirate in Hiding is, his, is her um, status because she uh, shares knowledge with other people. So that's bad. She's from Kazakhstan, actually, as it turns out. And we, right, she's in hiding. We don't know where she is. I, you know, and if I've said these things before, I feel like I looked that up later on. OK, this is a piece that I want to uh, include earlier, but I sort of, you know, I have this sandbox of stuff, and I don't always get through it. I think it just keeps getting bigger. But this is about the most cited papers of all time. And <coughs> maybe I can show this little piece here. OK, let's do this. It's just be about a minute. Go away. Which are the world's most cited papers? Sorry. Nature asked Thomson Reuters for the top 100 from its Web of Science database, which goes back more than a century. If you printed out the first page of every item in this index, the stack of paper would almost reach to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. More than half has been cited only once or not at all. Only the top metre and a half of the mountain has more than 1,000 citations. Among these, Watson and Crick's paper on the structure of DNA. But to reach the top 100 takes something extra special. At number one, with over 300,000 citations, is a 1951 paper describing a way to measure the amount of protein in a solution. Similar biological methods dominate the list, along with papers on software and statistics. These most cited papers aren't the most glamorous, Many of them got to the top by a quirk of luck or circumstance. Still, scientists have relied on these techniques to make more famous advances. Explore some more of the top 100. Okay, so the quirk of luck we'll get to later on. That's an interesting statement about this. Um, oh dear. Okay. Uh, they, these are papers that make science possible. That's what they are, right? And I know I may, I think I mentioned this obliquely, but you know, you can explore this and play around with it and so on. It's pretty well done. Google Scholar is quite different, actually, right? They've got the infographic. The Google Scholar is quite different, and that's down here somewhere. They have the same three top papers in different orders, actually. But because Google Scholar munches everything it can, it's got, um, let's see, so numerical recipes, which is really still a wonderful uh, resource. There's numerical recipes in C and Fortran, which you probably don't want. But the two or three page description that comes before each algorithm is really, really great stuff. So Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions is, is actually the sort of first, I mean, that, that's really enormously far up on this list. This is Google Scholar's top ordering. And you can see it doesn't even make a mention over here because they don't have books in there. So number of books, right? So this is genetic algorithms. That's 1989. And of course, these are things that should be in the list. Uh, but so these break away from the you know, making science happen. I mean, this is about science itself. People got excited. The word paradigm was very exciting. And Shannon, as we've talked about, is there. OK. So I want to put that in there. That's a power law size distribution story. Um, you know, so if you get off zero, you've done well. Your paper's done well. It's got one citation. That's a win. If it gets to 10, you're fantastic. Um, OK. We'll see more crazy citation numbers soon. OK, there's that. I'm going to just jump from this. This is a piece that really should be included in robustness. And uh, if you like listening to podcasts, I would recommend this one. So it's Tree to Shining Tree. Um, maybe it's 20 or 30 minutes long. I can't see where that is. 
But it's, be, it's about this observation that's been made over the last 20 years now with increasing sort of refinement that the trees, trees and forests are all connected to each other and they're connected through fungal networks as well, right? So this is a, the robustness story here is kind of fantastic. If one gets sick, it actually effectively, you know, and not purposefully, but communicates this information to other trees around it. So you can, I think the first, it was actually from loggers, right? They wanted to know more about their forests and someone went out and essentially put some radioactive stuff into one tree and then all these other trees that were quite distant relatively started to, you know, glow as well or whatever was the thing they put into it. And they figured out that they're connected in this kind of really interesting way. So that's a, you know, that's a sort of a great story for a very sort of Tolkien-esque idea of things. Um, but the fungus is really important. There are all these little networks, all these little highways that bring actual minerals into the trees. And in fact, in some of these trees, you'll find, you know, if you're up in like Alaska and stuff, you find uh, bits of salmon in there, basically, right? Because they've been able to suck some salmon up. Yeah. <laughs> so that's weird. Anyway, that fits into the robustness thing, which we've been talking about. And can I click on this? Okay. All right. I think that's probably enough. I was going to quickly show you. I've had a few Matrixology people here. Um, you know, I did this last fall. I recorded all these at home. So these are different things. So this was nice. The one that's got the, mo you know, and you never know what's going to, if anyone will watch any of these things, that's fine. It doesn't really. But this one here, actually, people watch this one a lot. It's SVD, right? which we took a long wait, this is like 70, right, non-painless <laughs> uh, things. But anyway, people, people like that one. So there's not too much abuse. It's always dangerous to look at the, uh, the unhappiness, but um, yeah, people said some nice things. So that was good. Anyway. I don't know why, you know, if you look at Strang, he says it's a great place to get to in a first course. And it's so, right, you don't. I didn't see it in my undergrad. Yeah, no, I, I've been talking to people about this. Yeah, it's like ending Monty Python's Holy Grail without, it, as it ends, like, get arrested. I mean, it's no good. It's like, there's a, there is a place to get to. It's everywhere, yeah. Yeah, principal component analysis, like, it's got different names in different places. It's great. Yeah? Madness. Yeah, right. What's wrong? What, right. Why not? Why not? But it takes a long time to get there, to do it well. Right. Yeah. <coughs> SVD. And, it, you know, not a good, not, not good branding. <laughs> My wife asked me about it this morning because I was showing this thing and she said, I said, it's SVD. She said, what's that? Singular value decomposition. It's like, okay. What's that? <laughs> I think I made a good... So anyway, okay. <coughs> okay, there are two more assignments put up, but, uh, you know, we can, we can move these due dates, right? There's one that's due this weekend. We can move these around a little bit, but I just sort of placed them out there. This is a small one. It's just got one question, and this one has got some network stuff in it and uh, a few more power law size distribution things in, so which connects you back to the start of the course. So those things exist. There are all these tweets. I don't need to talk about these. These were fun. Uh, actually caught up on all the things, I think. Um, all the episodes are up if you need them. Uh, this was interesting. So. Uh, Go, of course, AlphaGo, very famous. This is AlphaGo Zero, I think. So there's no human training. There's no, no human games went into this. So Alpha, yes? Uh, yeah, that's, that's bad. Yeah. Yep, that's my problem with my three different places for things. All right, I'll fix that for you. Okay. It's a, it's, it should, they're all Fridays. It's just a Monday thing. Calendars. All right. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the original AlphaGo, which of course was this amazing thing, was trained uh, initially on uh, human games, right? And then it played itself over and over and get, got better. But now this is actually something that's just no, no human. This is a bit disappointing, actually. <laughs> it's even worse. Um, so they're winning. They're going to win in more interesting ways. Okay. That is where we are. I'm just going to get rid of this because I can't. Okay. That's good. Good. Oh, yeah. Well, we can talk about that later on. It's pretty... Well, okay. It was mentioned. So, dongle mad, mad, madness over here. This is uh, Douglas Adams. I think we think it's 98. Um, but he mentioned... He, he uses this word dongles. I'm not sure if... So, I, I don't know. Is that where it comes from? But basically claims that in the future, computers will be just sold to sell you dongles. Yeah. Totally right. I mean, this thing, this is like 50 bucks. 
for an outdated thing. Yeah, okay. In the spirit of my, my mother would be very proud of me because I label everything. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Don't want to lose your dongles. It's bad. Okay. All right. Okay, so good, 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 good. And then we'll thrash on to some, some of this stuff. Okay, so there's just a last piece here in supply networks. And because it blew up, I'm in the wrong place. Okay. So this is a paper that came out in 2009, right? So it's, we've sort of traced this work back into the mid-last century, uh, people thinking about this density, density uh, law. And right, this was the sort of big result we've been focusing on, that the density of facilities, if they're optimally allocated so as to minimize the average, if you like, effort, or we sort of framed it as travel time for individuals to get to those facilities, like hospitals, post offices, whatever it is, um, scaled as the population density to the two-thirds. And so that was the big story, but it turns out that's not true, right? So once again, uh, if you think about the Newman paper, they did simulations and they did have population density from census data, but then they, the thing they did was place facilities down, right? They made, that's all made up. So it's a mixture of reality and then make-believe, you know, optimal make-believe. So you have to be a little careful with that, thinking about what's gone into it. So these guys actually looked, these people looked at um, actual data, always dangerous, and uh, showed that in fact there's a, there's a range of scalings. And their claim in the end, and we'll sort of just quickly go through it, is that commercial fa facilities where you're just simply trying to make as much money as possible, which would, might be thought of as we want as many people coming in the door as possible. And, and so we actually will then tend towards having a density of facilities that scales more like the density of, of people, right? So you're going to pack more McDonald's and Starbucks and those sorts of things into where the people are. Makes complete sense. But, um, you know, this two-thirds then is the interesting one, remains the interesting one, and, and you're pulling back from being um, completely for-profit. So they looked at data from uh, the, yeah, US and South Korea, so it's a South Korean group. And let's see if we've got a couple. So one, the first one is uh, hospitals in the US, particular kind, public schools in the US. Uh, so this scaling, and again, lots of, you know, it's a little messy, right? But uh, for sure, and there's some error on this, but the scaling is much more like one. This one is closer to two-thirds, although you'd, you'd, once the population uh, density seems to go up, then it seems to actually change. Although, as we've sort of talked about, this isn't, I mean, there's two orders of magnitude here where you might start to claim there's something different going on. They didn't, but I think that's interesting to look at. Uh, you know, that's starting to look at places like New, New York City and so on, right? That things are really packed in. Okay, so that's a, the statement at the bottom. That's actually for a density of about 100 per kilometer squared. So, lots of one of these things where they, you know, all of this is hidden, right? So we'd like to see these. We'd like to see all of these because, at least to the eye, it kind of helps you feel like they've done okay and you want all the data. But, you know, it's a paper and it gets reduced to a table. Uh, they have us, they do show R squareds. Um, we can, we're, all right, we can talk about that. Uh, so there's this idea between, that they sort of break them between, um, uh, so this is South Korea and the US at the top, and they, there's a suggestion that these things sort of transform into being clearly more public uh, around 0.8 exponent. Um, you know, and these, the errors are, as we've seen, right, these errors are ridiculous, right? 1.8 plus or minus 0.02. I mean, it's very optimistic, right? Uh, and as you've played around with things, right, if you've changed the range over which you measure the exponent, then these numbers change pretty strongly, but the optimistic nature of regression is, is such. This is a weird one, public health center. It doesn't scale at all, actually, 0.09, right? If you see a scaling like 0.1, it's basically... Yeah, maybe there's actually some truth that it's logarithmic or something, but it's, uh, it's basically zero, right? And that's because this is a government thing where they just said, we're going to have these public, these health facilities, and they're really just going to be there, 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 and just with re without regard to population or geography, basically just went and uh, put them uniformly around uh, throughout South Korea. So that's, that's a very anomalous situation. But generally, yeah. And so there's an argument for this. Um, so this is the stuff we saw before. Um, Voronoi diagrams, you can sort of see the, the story. So this is, the, again, the hospitals and public schools. Um, <coughs> hospitals having this kind of um, more linear or even super linear scaling. And you can see that sort of 
you know, the low density uh, areas of the US having you know, many, it's, it's visible here, right? There are less facilities out here and this is trying to help the world a little more. So it's, they're gonna sort of pack them in a bit more. And these are gonna be much more focused around cities. And that's just a slightly visual thing. I think you can see it to some extent, yeah, with the top one, okay. So the story is, and we'll just go through this, right? So uh, the social institutions are going to minimize the distance of travel. The commercial ones want to maximize the number of, of visitors. And so they set up a couple of ways to think about this. Basically, uh, the cost is going to include the population and the typical distance they travel. And this is then going to be a tunable piece, right? So right to so the number of, number of people you get in and then their um, typical distance. So if this, if we're worried about how you know, how far they travel, then we'll dial this up, right? So beta equals one is purely social. And if we just, we don't care how far they travel, we can dial it back to zero and we'll have a purely commercial thing. So, you know, the upshot of this is they're going to claim that uh, you can, you know, you have this, th this is clear, just a model, right? But it's a tunable piece um, that will give you a tunable exponent on the other end that can go between say two thirds and one. So that's the achievement of these guys. Um, there's a bug in that one. That is. Okay, so that's, that's fine. And I, I don't, we don't need to, I just wanted to tell you about this. It's a very, it's a beautiful result. So uh, lots of, so we do the same kind of approach as we have for Gaston, Gaston, Gaston and Newman, which was building on, this is actually one person, Gusein Zaid. Uh, they do the same thing. It was a calculus of variations approach. And in a way, it all, it, it all looks the same. It feeds through, and we get this 2 over beta plus 2. So if we look at this, right, if we put in 0, which is the um, for-profit one, it's going to be 2 over 2, which is the right thing. This is just normalization on the bottom. If we put in beta equals 1, which is the pure social one, we get 2 thirds. So well done, them. Very good. And that's what these statements say. So that's a, <coughs> that's a dead thing, because I, I hold this over from complex networks. And stuck it in. So don't worry, delete, delete. All right, that's it. Okay, so that's a, that was a, you know, a pretty powerful development in this, in this sort of understanding of kind of a basic thing, actually, yeah. Um, does this change for, like, this for, oh, yeah. Um, I mean, you see the, the, the strength of government programs to just sort of, you know, assert things, right? Like, let's, let's, like that's the, South, the one example from South Korea of the, these public health centers. I don't know, I haven't seen, I have not seen data from, and it, you know, it's been, a, it's been eight years now, I haven't seen data from, it's not something we've worked on. It's a good question. Um, more data. So you need to have good census data for populations and you of course have to have good data on the, the uh, facilities. Should be able to, you absolutely should be able to do this for somewhere like, you know, Scandinavia, right? I mean, they, they have uh, ridiculous amounts of data um, that they collect on people. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but you could see it would be kind of a m mistake, right? You could easily, you can kind of make a mistake. You can just place, you know, place things in the wrong, wrong way, which seems to be the case for that South Korean one. People are crazy. Okay, so. Good question, very good. All right, so I'm just gonna quickly tell you about this. It's not something we're gonna, I'm not gonna give you questions on it, we're gonna dwell on it too much, but I just need you to know, we've talked a lot about power law size distributions. And I wanna quickly, this is called log normals, but it points to the fact that there are other heavy tail distributions that come out of other models and you know, match the data in different ways. There's a lot of arguing about this in the literature. You know, Is this really a, power law for a start, not just the exponent, but is it really a power law and does my mechanism work and so on. And, you know, we've tried to do a good job with, say, um, you know, Simon's model does seem to hold up mechanistically at the detail level for certain kinds of systems. That's very powerful, you know, including huge things like the web. But this is just to show you there are other things. It's a terrible pun uh, tarot cut. Very bad. So a couple of others. So there's the log normal distribution. And quickly, you know, again, this is going to be quick. I'm just sort of run through this and we'll start to talk about complex networks, right? So this is a 
The log normal, I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Uh, Weibull distribution, uh, which is a generalization of the um, exponential, right? So if mu equals one here, then this is e to the minus x over lambda. Very nice. So that's often invoked for failure uh, mechanisms. Now, um, so you can see what you have is a power law here, right? So if, if this mu minus one is a negative quantity, then there's a power law and an exponential cutoff. All right. So this doesn't look like a power law, right? It doesn't really. It's got an exponential of some stuff up here, but there is this x over here, and that's really the, the story. So other things, gamma distributions. So you have to be, basically, this is about being careful. Let's talk about the log normal a little bit. Here's its form. What's going on is uh, log x is distributed normally. Uh, and it appears in a lot of systems where there's growth um, and things are you know, at least of size, um, are of positive size, right? They can't go to negatives. So here's the uh, couple of pieces for it, right? So they're, they're a bit odd, right? So we always do this. We use the underlying normal distribution structure, right? Here's mu, here's the mean, the standard deviation. If you then go for the, to the log normal and actually compute the mean of it and its standard deviation, they are these funny looking beasts. They're all related to this underlying log normal. It's a very different thing to a power law. All of, all of the moments are finite, which was a big deal for these um, power law size distributions, especially ones with infinite variance and so on, even infinite mean. Okay, you don't have to again, you don't have to worry about this too much. So one of these transformation stories, right? We've done this a number of times. So let's take uh, y equals log x. So we're going to just replace our, we're going to start with a um, normal distribution. This is the classic normal distribution. Put y equals log x in here. So that's going to come down here. There's a little transformation here. This is dy equals 1 over x dx, right? So if you differentiate it, dy dx equals 1 over x. So this is our Jacobian. We're going to replace uh, dy with dx over x. So that's what happens. The dx, this dy, becomes dx over x. And that's where we start to get a power law. There's this piece here, so we have to think about that as well. Um, <coughs> e to the log x, of course, is x. So we have to worry about that. Let's do it. Um, this is why it's confusing. So this is a log normal in blue and a power law in red. Uh, it has that very extreme exponent of gamma equals 1, which we know is not normalizable. Um, and this is one with mu. It doesn't really matter too much about the parameters for the log normal. But, you know, to the eye, there's a lot of orders of magnitude, potentially. I mean, you could get excited and think it goes out here, but there's really sort of four orders of magnitude here where these things are tracking pretty well. And then the um, log normal starts to deviate from a straight line. So the red one is a straight line. So that's a bit of a concern. Um, and so what's happening is if we just take the log of the, this uh, underlying log normal, just a little bit of math, take the log of this, right, it's a big blob, and we're going to use natural log because it's built in that way. You can always do transforms. Uh, all these things come down, right? So there'll be... Uh, minus log x for that one, that one over x out the front. This is going to be log of this blob. That's a constant. That'll be here. Uh, exponential. So we just take the log of that. All of this blob comes down. And then I've squared things out and you know, put terms together. So there's something times log x squared, something times log x, and then a constant. So this is log px equals, it looks like a, it's a parabolic thing, right? So what we see over and over again is these linear things. So there's none of this term but something times log of x. So this is the exponent sitting in front of log x. Right? That's, this is the normal kind of power law size distribution. Constant, constant times log of x, be log 10 of x. Um, <coughs> and so if this term is small, right, there's a large standard deviation here, if this, or for the underlying normal, then this is relatively small, then this is the basic story. And we have to be a little more careful in this, but this is the basic story. It's going to look like log of x, log of the probability distribution is going to look like log of x times this constant, and this will be our exponent, right? It'll be x to the minus this blob. So it's going to look like a power law. So lots and lots of arguing. Gamma is this thing, 1 minus mu over sigma squared. All right, so we can play around this a little more. We can worry about it. Um, I don't really need to say this. This is like when will the crossover, when will it start to deviate from being a pure power law? If you have a minus one exponent, then you know, it may, if you have something that looks like it's a minus one exponent and starts to fall away, it may be a log normal. Um, 
It could be that, uh, that sorry, I'm sorry, I know I'm sort of skipping along, but this is, you know, this, ex this is gamma. You know, it could be that that is not one, of course. So, okay, fine. <coughs> so, how do we get these things? Very simple, actually, right? So, random multiplicative growth. So, if the nth plus one version of a system's you know, measure, x, is some random variable times xn, where r is greater than zero, right? We're just sampling from at whatever distribution you like, um, exponentials, anything. So, it's a random growth variable. Then, in log space, just take the log of this thing then this is exactly what we get for a normal distribution story, right? So we're adding something, some random number, add, add, add. This is really our, like our random walk story, right? And so we end up with normal distributions. It's the central limit theorem. So log x is normally distributed, which means that x is log normally distributed. So this is an incredibly simple mechanism that can give rise to log normals. That's why it's an appealing story, because it should be measurable. You should be able to find out if that's there. Uh, so let's see, this is uh, from, this is a famous paper of Gibraltar, 931, uh, claimed that firm sizes scale, uh, so firm size being the number of employees has a power law size distribution, right? So this is a, uh, this is, yeah, so firm size is here, this is the probability, right? So it's in the power law size distribution kind of category. Claimed that a log normal, this, this sort of log, this uh, uh, random growth model would give you that. Uh, but that's, that gives you gamma as one. So uh, Robert Axtell, who's a pretty famous character in complex systems and especially thinking about economics in interesting ways, uh, showed, you know, and this is a pretty big data set, right? This is one, this is um, <coughs> six orders of magnitude here. This is a paper that appeared in Science, got a lot of uh, press for itself, that the exponent is actually much more like two. So it's a different game. And so I think he has about 100 pages of supplementary material trying to... <laughs> understand why it's not such a simple model. And I'm not, we don't have to go through this, but basically there's a paper here that says, instead of just being this simple update rule, have that update, the next, the firm size in the next year, say, is gonna be some random number times what it is now, but there's gonna be a, a flaw. And so this is the average of all the firms now, this is some constant C, so it can't go to zero. So it's going to look like a random walk, but there's going to be a floor at the bottom, right? There's going to be a boundary. So this is sort of including a boundary. It's a bit of a funny one. This, this, the other thing I'm trying to just convey very quickly with these slides is, right, first of all, there are lots of different heavy tail distributions, and the mechanisms can be fickle. So if you just change it in this way, suddenly you get a completely different story, right? Again, you don't have to worry about this. Um, <coughs> instead of an exponent of the, a log normal distribution that looks like it has an exponent one, Again, don't worry about this. You suddenly, you can go through all the derivation. You end up with an exponent, which is one plus one over uh, one minus C. That was that little, it could be a very small constant. The point is, the exponent is close to two. So, very small change. If you don't let them essentially um, vanish, you, you put a sort of a flaw there, then, which makes sense. Firms, you know, have one person, not a billionth of a person in them. Then, uh, then you get a very different outcome. You get power law size distributions, and you get the right exponent. And you're not gonna, you don't have to worry about that. No, no problem for that. Uh, lots of other things you can do. This is just, again, very quickly. So if you say, well, what if uh, the, the, the firms have different ages? Which, of course, they do, right? And so let's just put in a theoretical one, which is an exponential distribution. Then you get something, and again, just flashing through. You don't have to worry about this. You get something completely different. Now you get a probability distribution which actually has a break in scaling. It has two... It has it's two power laws with a clear break in scaling. So that's just adding a pretty natural thing, which is aging, uh, different ages of firms, uh, but then going back to just a pure random growth model, right? That thing that led to a log normal. If everyone starts at the same time and you have random growth, then you get a log normal. But if you have them at different ages, then uh, having, having lived for different times, then you get... This, this double, this break in scaling. Very, uh, sc power laws with a break in scaling. Very, very different. All right. So that's the summary. I mean, I just wanted to do this quickly, and I know I'm rushing through this. Um, <coughs> you can get this problem. Certainly log normals, power laws can be awfully um, similar. There are um, th what I call the random multiplicative growth model. That gives us a log normal distribution, just in the way that we have random walks coming, giving uh, the normal distribution. Uh, we added a minimum size, that's, that switched it, 
to something that looked like a, was a log normal, looked like it had a minus one exponent, to something that has a minus two exponent. Uh, and then if we you know, remove the minimum size constraint, but have a distribution of lifetimes, then suddenly you get this double Pareto or double power law distribution. Anyway, um, this is just a little caveat at the end. Not everything is a power law size distribution. People get carried away. When we talk about networks next, not every, not every network we'll talk about will be you know, some of these main networks that I tell you about. There are a lot of others. Okay. So that was just smashing through things. All right. Yeah, for the underlying normal. Yeah, so in this. Um, so, so log of x is distributed normally, but we're going to think about it in terms of x, right? Because we're yeah. crazy. Yeah. So when you do that, you know, this is this is the, yeah, for, this is the mean value of x. If the log of x is distributed normally, then the mean of x will be distributed. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll have this form. And mu log normal is the actual mean of the observation. Yeah. Just the mu. And, and really, the, the thing is that 1 over x at the end. So if we wrote p of x uh, dx, which is you know, the sort of good thing, right? we have all this. And then there's this 1 over x at the end, dx. Then this piece here is d ln of x. Right, and then all of this blob here has an ln of x in it. So this is really p of ln of x d ln of x. So we sort of are really starting here. And you go back to this thing, and in that shape, you see a 1 over x here, and, and the, yeah. But a lot of, yeah, a lot of, uh, sorry for that, orange is terrible, a lot of arguing and insanity and so on. But certainly, you know, like these things, you know, power laws are everywhere, right? So everyone found power laws everywhere, da da da. And there's some people like, no, no. And we'll see this with networks too, right? So all networks are like my network that I thought of. Right? The thing that will tie this back together, there's going to be a couple of different places uh, we'll get to. We'll get to um, small world networks, which is a new thing, right? That's about search and so on. We'll also get to scale-free networks, which is essentially a um, reincarnation of um, De Solar Price and uh, Simon's Rich Gets Richer model. Okay. Rediscovery, let's say that. Okay, complex networks. Good things. Okay, so a huge explosion in the ability to understand reality was basically about networks. All right, so um, this is a definition from a, a while ago, but it's kind of interesting to look at the, the way this thing move through, and I have a couple of slides that maybe are out of order, I suppose. Obviously, there's this thing that we use now to network, but it, it went through this sort of very, it went from a very physical kind of description, and we'll go further back in time, but network of railroads, um, and then we have trade networks and so on, and then we started to get these new technologies, so there's, there's television, um, and then, of course, computers, right? Uh, but it starts further back. Uh, and it has, this, this is just to say that it's a good word. Network's kind of a fun word. Web, ladder, you know, these are, these are some delicious words. Um, reticulum. It's kind of funny, the web and the internet are different things, right? But they're always sort of conflated. Right? The web sits on top. And people really did used to say World Wide Web all the time. But that's gone. Um, uh, internet no longer has a capital I, right? That's gone. So sad. It's not a, yeah. No. Okay, so Keith Briggs, this is kind of, odd. he was a postdoc at Melbourne Uni when I was there a long time ago. And he was, for chaos fans, he was trying to find uh, Feigenbaum's number to the furthest, you know, like world record number of digits. <laughs> you know, because why not? Um, <coughs> uh, anyway, so uh, I think he's been working with British Telecom for a long time. So opus ret reticulatum, so this sort of a lat so this is a, a, a physical work, right? This is a work of stone, which work uh, in, the sh in the shape of sort of a, a net kind of thing. So that's an old one. But there is the Geneva Bible, right? So there's a great like network of brass, so there's these old things. Uh, and as, as I was trying to say before, there's sort of this history, right? So there's structures in animals, 
you know, blood networks is a big deal, which we talk about in complex networks and stuff I worked on ages ago. Then we get to rivers and canals, big deal for moving stuff around. So we had to talk about it a lot. And of course, we had to talk about railways, electrical things. That's the 1800s, uh, broadcasting networks. Uh, but it goes further back to, um, it looks like spiderweb, actually. First used for spiderweb. That's uh, in Old English. Work is a good word. Uh, and so then any, any of these things, network, right, ironwork, stonework, fretwork, it's the work of a, in, in the shape of a net. So it's okay. It's okay. Not a bad word. And then complex networks, fine. We know what we're talking about. So the big deal, sorry, a little bit of excursion into histories of things, uh, complex systems, right? Many complex systems are, of course, network structures. And I'll kind of give you a little sort of taxonomy of them, the, the things we can think about. But this, you know, obviously this has sort of been true forever, and, and it's not as if this is sort of absolutely a new observation, but, um, well, the transition is, uh, so first of all, once we sort of start talking about it in this way, then we've got lots of uh, mathematical things we can do, lots of numerical things we can do. And I suppose in some ways the anchor that we had before is a lot of simulations and a lot of, like these little complex networks models, these little toy models, they're all on grids usually. And it was like, oh, well, let's change the lattice in some other way. They're all on, usually on 2D grids because that's sort of something we could see. And I think maybe it connects back to material science a little bit, right? That we've got a lot of, a lot of and we, we just know a lot about lattices. But a lot of things are really on networks, and that gets messier, harder to, to show, harder to kind of picture. Um, so the initial work um, was certainly in this sort of uh, physics stat mech kind of flavor. There's been a lot more computer science, a lot of machine learning and so on that's come in later to solve certain kinds of problems at large scales. Um, but the, the amount of work is, is really ridiculous, right? So now we're getting out almost 20 years, and, which is crazy. It's a fifth of a century, and it's just exploded over that time. Um, as I said, physics has been a big part of it, and it's these people. Though, so they, they tend to just sort of devour fields that, are, that they discover and um, then remorselessly move on. So that is still happening. These people are still feeding on complex networks, and they're still sort of making up little areas to colonize and so on. Um, but it's getting a little... Uh, you know, specific and kind of out there. So anyway, but networks aren't going away, so that's a big deal. Oh, this should be good. XKCD, this is, I believe this is, yeah, yeah. Maybe you've seen this one, right? You're trying to predict the behavior of system, just model it as a simple object, then add some secondary terms to account for complications I just thought of. Easy. Why does your field need a whole journal anyway? So liberal arts majors may be annoying sometimes, but there's nothing more obnoxious than a physicist first encountering a new subject. And this is really true. This is really, really true. You know, if you have a, a really true physicist come in, or someone maybe from a tech field, and they're like, ah, if you need some help with the math, let me know, but that should be enough to get you started. No, I don't need to read your thesis. I can imagine roughly what it says. They do that, but then they get, um, uh, then they actually try to do something, and then they become ashamed. Usually, unless the Dunning-Kruger is kind of too strong. But okay, yeah, okay. Popularity. So uh, here are the big papers we'll talk about: uh, complex complex networks. Um, uh, you know, that sort of started this field of complex networks. So this is a small world network story, which connects to Stanley Milgram, but actually has an origin to do with uh, crickets and grasshoppers, because that makes sense, right? But this is Strogatz. We've heard from Strogatz and my uh, um, colleague Duncan Watts. We worked together for six years at um, Columbia. And he's been, he went to Yahoo and then to Microsoft for a long time. OK. Uh, maybe he'll come back to academia. We'll see. So, uh, and then Barbaraji and Albert. So this is a, you know, both of these things are incredibly famous. And as you can see now, this is Google Scholar. Um, I was checking this morning. Uh, citations are strong. So. And I think, and I have the, the deltas, right? This one added 4,000 in the last year, and then um, maybe three and a half here. So uh, these have been very influential, and, and, and so much so that people have kind of got anchored by them. Like, these are the only possible networks that exist, right? So you've got to be a little careful with that. But we're really going to talk about them because they're incredibly interesting and important. They are big deals. Um, you know, people aren't just citing because they're crazy, although that is still true as well, because you know, most citations for these things will be, just as anything that takes off is, complex networks are interesting, you know, citation one through 12. And, right, that's always gonna be true. 
Uh, this is, uh, some re- these are some review articles. You know, there are many things, and, and you know, I'd, it'd be nice to have a... Uh, I want to look to see if there's more recent stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is 2006, uh, this is 2003, this is Mark Newman, we'll again look at, so Mark Newman, of course, we looked at his work just recently for the supply networks and the cartograms, we'll come back and look at that again, uh, and this is Albert Bar- uh, Barabasi, this is a, uh, Reviews of Modern Physics, a very, um, you know, potent uh, review journal, so again, doing quite well, so a lot of papers from back, this, back in this time that, that succeeded, you know, things like diameter of the World Wide Web or robustness of the web, blah, 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 They're Huge, huge. Okay. So it was easy pickings early on. Uh, there are a couple of textbooks that actually do pertain to this. There's Mark Newman, again, as I mentioned, who's at Michigan. Uh, so I don't know David Easley. He's a, uh, in economics. John Kleinberg, uh, I think, currently holds a MacArthur Genius Award. Certainly got one a few years ago. Um, uh, he's a uh, computer scientist at Cornell. Incredibly lovely guy. Just, it's important to say this because, you know, um, Famous scientist, that's sort of rare um, in my experience, and he is really just, just a tremendous human being. So one of our first students actually from StoryLab went and worked with him and did her PhD and is now at Facebook, Isabel Klaumann. Great. Oh, and with Trogats, right? So they work together. Yep. Okay, so that, that if you're in economics-minded um, stuff. This is uh, books, you know, these are early on. Uh, Gladwell, of course, talked a lot about networks. I'm going to say there's some good stuff in here, but there's some terrible stuff, which is Gladwell is just... Boy, um, I mean, he just he just spins it out. Pinker a few years ago, if you're interested in Gladwell, and you, he does tell some tales, right? And he's recently sort of said he's a storyteller, which is interesting. Uh, you know, he had a, he had some story where he wrote about these things called um, this is rough. Stephen Pinker had a piece in the New York Times saying just saying call just kind of having a go at. Uh, Gladwell saying, stop listening to this person, right? Because he is incredibly influential. This is eigenvalues. <coughs> so that was unfortunate. Um, okay, Mark Buchanan has been a science writer for a long time, so this is going to be one of these, artic- you know, one of these books about you know, this exciting stuff that's happening in this new field. Uh, and then, you know, these characters I've just mentioned, Barabasi, who's one of the main characters at the Northeastern uh, Network Science Institute, which has you know, really grown in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, so he wrote a book back in, back in the day, and then um, Duncan wrote this one. Actually, yeah, when, when we were at Columbia, in fact, yeah. So that got a lot of, uh, lot of press, too. Okay, lots of other books, just to point you to them. Some of these are very physics-ish, right? Some are mathematical, but there's a lot of different things there. Okay, so... It really took off. So graph theory, of course, right? I mean, we probably have done it. So why isn't that the case? Graph theory is well established. Euler is sort of famously pointed to as the first person to kind of talk about it, right, with the bridges of Konigsberg and how you wander around. Um, so social networks really studied, started as a quantitative field in the 1930s. It was a little bit of a fringe area, right? But it was sitting there. People are, you know, going in and interviewing people in organizations or schools and asking who speaks to whom and you know, who's friends with whom and so on. Um, so, you know, small data, very important. So why is it all new, right? It's, well, it's the data, it's the data thing, right? So data takes off. The, we'll see some of the data sets underlying those two big papers. You know, there were things that were newly accessible. They're published in 98, right? So they've been worked on in 96, 97, even back for Duncan, I know. He published one paper, actually, in his PhD. And um, that was it. And it ca- actually, so they sent it to Nature, and the story was, I'll come back to some more of this, but the story was that it got two reviews. One said, this is just percolation theory. This is not interesting. We know all about this. And the other one said, this is fantastic. It's new. So they sent it to a third person, who we know, I guess now, it's a pretty famous character, who said, this is great. And so, you know, that sort of flip of a coin sort of thing, it becomes, it gets published in Nature. He gets a book published, which is his thesis. And, you know, it becomes one of those books that people... Um, all around the world, you know, like government, you know, whatever, presidents and so on seem to have on their bookshelf to show that they're knowledgeable about things, right? So what happens, the military goes berserk about it. So uh, it, it takes off. And it was all just sitting there, right? It was all just sitting there. 
And I remember with my advisor at some point, because we, we, we do all this work on river networks and blood networks, one day I was just talking to my office and I said, networks seem to be a thing, right? So, and we, we, so we were just on the edge of it, and we talked about um, physical networks a lot. Anyway. But it's funny. I mean, even in, in 2000, 2001, I remember going back to my advisor, Dan Rothman, and saying, oh, I'm working on social phenomena, and it's like, you know, whatever. Like, expecting this, that's not... I mean, he's a really nice guy, but like, that's not real science, you know. It's like, oh, I think it's huge. It was, it was an important thing for him to say. Like, it's going to be a big, big deal. Um, the arguments with sociologists keep going. So th there is a problem here, of course. We could, uh, you know, much more... It's all good fun when there's no data and no experiments, actually, because you can make anything up you want. And actually, I, I, I feel I need to... There's some stuff that I s put back in here that I need to show you. Yes. Right, so remember where I talked about data being a big deal? There's a couple of things I want to say here about measurement, and I, I think it's not... I think it's reasonable to throw it back in. I, just, I should have had it in these notes, and I didn't. But let's think about measurement, right? I mean, this is what's going on. We've start, you know, and, and having, say, Twitter data doesn't mean you know everything about humans, or um, having email network, interaction networks. Again, it's, it's just a, a, a slice of something. But it's, it's gone, you've gone from data scarce to data rich, and that's a big deal. So, I mean, just thinking about measuring stuff that we, we or you know, quantities that we're very happy with the quantification of now, we think, oh, this is all simple. So uh, quarks, right? This took a long time, and it's, there's some strange things in here. So, of course, we, we put up some great big stones, you know, the um, couple with one on the top. Uh, sundials have been around for a long time. They're really important pieces, you know, all throughout Europe, for example. Uh, escapements are some sneakier things. That's around the 200s to keep it, you know, clicking. Uh, hourglasses, you'd think that's a really ancient one, but you have to make glass well, 1300s. Um, pendulum clocks, 1500s. And then, you know, the great transition was making clocks that really did, you, you could, they were incredibly precise and would be durable in the, in the way they were set, right? So that's the 1700s. I, I found this, this is a charming book from a while ago, 10 years. Uh, on, uh, right, there was, a, there was a lot of money available to anyone who could solve this problem of where, where you were on the sea, right? Because latitude we could get, but... Um, you know, there were all these ideas we could do it with stars and astrolabes and so on. So a lot of people were trying to figure that out. But longitude is a hard thing to get a sense of. But if you have a clock and you take the clock with you and you really know what time it is, then you'll be okay. And, you know, if you put a grandfather clock on with a big, you know, that's going to be a mess on a ship, right? So things didn't work out for clocks and your sundials and things. But this was just a straight up clock, right? Okay, and then, of course, we get to atomic clocks. And Kelvin, who I mentioned before about measurement, said, um, said we should be able to measure from those things eventually. Uh, it is kind of crazy, right? I mean, of course, now we have the satellite story, and we have GPS, we have incredible... Th that story from a couple of years ago that... Um, what was it? Um, uh, neutrinos could f travel faster than light, right? Spawned about 300 papers on the archive of all these people getting excited about it. And I'm sure there are some financial companies started where they're trying to figure out how to get neutrino cables between New York and Chicago. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they just started the company. You know, like, we've got to do this. Uh, but that turned out to be a, you know, a clock problem, right? They messed up, they messed up their clocks. Because um, general relativity actually matters for GPS. And GPS was started, apparently, or our, what we have now, like this thing gets GPS, right, because of Sputnik. So Sputnik goes up, and some Americans are going, this is not good. And thinking about it and saying, well, we could figure out, because of its beeping, we could figure out where it is. And then about three weeks later, one of them said, and I can't remember which group this was, said, um, we could do the opposite, right? With the satellites are there, we could figure out where we are. And that was an unbelievable thing. Yes. Escapement is the, um, you know, I don't know my clock's in a sort of uh, Rain Man type way, but uh, it's the things that keep hitting, right? You can be driven from water or something like that. It keeps hitting it to make it work around. Escapement. I feel embarrassed that I don't know that very well. It's a... Um, yeah. It's... Right. So it's to... It's... Okay. Yeah, it's to make it click. Do I have it right? I think so. Make it click. Yeah. And so there's water-driven ones, mechanical ones, all these sorts of things. Yeah. 
You see, I mean, people are very clever things, aren't they? The humans, right? Look at all this madness. Yeah. What's that? To make sure that you know, it keeps going the same. Yeah. yeah. So. Wow. <laughs> okay. So. Click, click. Okay, so that's clocks, right? I mean, you know, n now we, we have these unbelievable things. Actually, I feel sad for <sighs> little clocks that aren't internet connected, you know, like, um, because they're just alone, right? They don't change when everyone else changes for daylight savings, and they just, it's sad. I was, I, they don't know anyone. Like, your little, I mean, obviously, it would be a disaster when you're, they're special. I know, I know, well, there's a flip side to like your oven, your stove is actually monitoring your, what you ate and talking to you and saying, it's too much mac and cheese this week. <laughs> really? Really? Um, so temperature, right? Temperature was, you know, clocks, you think, oh, it's hard. But temperature was really, and you don't have to read this at all, but temperature, and Galileo was involved as well. They thought this was insane. People generally thought this was just not going to work out because we have our own perceptions of temperature that was just going to be too, yes, it's hotter and colder, but it's, there's not going to be like a number, like a, you know, you measure a distance or a time. So there's a whole a wonderful book on this um, that's uh, Inventing Temperature, this one here, yeah. Um, so it's just thought to be impossible. That's all I want to say about that. But of course, now we're, we, we're, we're great at it. And, and then the second, okay, the, the thing I really want to say is this then just, and then once we got temperature measured properly, or were able to do it reliably, um, the world of thermodynamics opened up, right? The sci that science exploded and took off and became this great science and incredibly important for the Industrial Revolution, which you may or may not like. Okay. If you're feeling unibomberish, then you will not be happy. Okay. Oh, there's one more piece of this. So this is about data, and I'm talking about networks, you know, taking off because of data. Um, and this is just a little, I cut this up. This is a little cartoon I cut up. So this is, this is thinking, having a nice thought, right? Right? This is, you know, like the pure thinking. No. <laughs> So this is the problem, right? I mean, you, ideally you stay in this world if, if that sort of fits you and you keep away from these things and then sad. <laughs> That's kind of how it works. Okay. Anyway, we have to sort of just grow up and eat it, basically, is the, is the situation. Um, okay, lots of data. I know that was a thing, but I just needed to... Well, some new pieces. Okay, we can at least describe things. We want to explain things as well. So again, we're going to try to find out <coughs> mechanistic explanations, if we can. <coughs> String theory. So, right, I mean, you know, there are some nice fields that you can go into. Philosophy's pretty good. Seems they're pretty good at uh, keeping themselves walled away from reality. So I think there was a study recently that something like only about, there were four things that maybe 70% of philosophers you know, uh, surveyed agreed upon, which was mathematics is okay, I think, was one. I think neuroscience, no. <laughs> um, your experiences, though, were okay, too, I think. Yeah, there were a couple other things. Um, but yeah, they're not, yeah. You've got to keep the data away. Okay, and of course, you can get carried away. So this is the web scale sort of data sets that, you know, appeared and big, we got excited, we called it big data. Of course, big data existed, it just wasn't about us, so once... Uh, became about us, we started to give it a little bit of an extra name. Um, <coughs> yeah, there are lots of jokes about this, right? Google just calls big data, data, right? So the end of theory. So I mean, there are these papers a bit. So this is all oh, these, these one, one's a paper, this is in Wired, right? The data deluge makes scientific theory obsolete. Just don't worry about it. Just make, this is, I mean, that's, that one is actually, I don't think, It's 2008, right? So it's not, yeah, look at that. Don't think about it. They love it. Okay, that's 2008. So, you know, deep learning hasn't taken off. I mean, we're well before the tragedy of Go. Um, uh, but 
you know, this is just crazy, right? And then there's this, uh, this these are actually Google, a couple of people, Google, the unreasonable effectiveness of data. And this is a play on this famous paper by the un uh, Vigna, the un unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. Because it is a bit strange, right, that you can use mathematical stuff. Stop, but then it's not, you know, it depends how you're thinking about it, you know? So it's like, oh, it all makes sense. And then you're like, what? Like, how can you, yeah. Um, so if you feel like that sometimes, you might want to look at this if you have not. All right, we need to understand, right? I mean, this is not, so it's describe and explain is basic science. If you're trying to make lots of money, maybe not. However, that has finally, you know, this is sort of really, these things have really turned around. This is not what's being said by large corporations anymore. Because this is great, but you can't then go and you can't understand why this black box thing told you to do a thing. Um, it made lots of money for you for a while, but now it doesn't, and you're not sure why. Um, that's bad. And in some areas, you are actually, you know, mandated to be able to explain why your machine, you know, spat out this thing because there's actually some <laughs> laws sitting around that that uh, require that. Okay. Good. Yep. <coughs> okay. So some very basic definitions. So I just want to give you a taxonomy, then we'll talk about some important quantities associated with what we'll call complex networks. Um, yeah, important quantities. And they're a bit of a hodgepodge, and this is still true. This is a bit of an odd thing. It's a bit of a hodgepodge, uh, and they're used to sort of illustrate various aspects of reality, or been, they've been kind of invented to do that. Okay, so. Nodes, right? We'll use these words. I mean, they're vertices and so on, different things, but this is sort of the language of it. Nodes and links, um, simple things, right? They could be, you know, people, of course, proteins, protein-protein interactions or protein-gene interactions. We can think about uh, um, bipartite kinds of networks as well, where there's, you know, different, it could be you know, um, actors in movies, right? There's sort of a different structure going on there. Uh, but anyway, the links... They, they can be very simple things, directed, undirected. They may be binary, which is just the sort of a, you just say that they exist or they don't, so it's zero or one. They can be weighted. It turns out that, you know, this is all pretty good for mathematically, but this started to, this has taken a long time to figure out. Barabaji, I mentioned uh, his work with Raker Albert on scale-free networks. She had an extra, like, six months at the end of her PhD. Her husband was still finishing. She had six months to go. She said, can I work on something else? And he said, uh, he basically laid out, yeah, let's do structure of networks, uh, dynamics of networks, and then structure, like dynamics of systems acting on networks. That should take six months. So um, we're probably through one and a half of that um, stuff 20 years in. So they got somewhere, but it's, uh, it's proved to be hard. So there's still work to do, but I think there are more things in the world to focus on, maybe. Okay, so... Um, Degree. This is a very important thing, right? This is a standard graph theory term. Degree. Uh, it's just the number of friends for a, uh, if you like, for, for a node, number of links coming out of a node. And because we'll tend not to think about weighted ones, we won't have to be too distressed about you know, the, the strength of those edges. But um, it's just going to be an integer, right? And we can, we can have networks where we have isolated nodes, of course. Um, so we'll, talk, we'll use this notation. Average degree, that's going to be an incredibly important thing. You'll see Z in the literature. That's just sort of a standard thing that's happened. Uh, okay, basic thing. So the average, right? So you have um, each node has these edges going out from it. And if we think about here, there's this edge adds, um, uh, it gives you an edge incident to this node and an edge incident to this node, right? It's two ends. So if there are M edges total, then there are two times that that end up at nodes. And if we divide that by the number of nodes, so this is the number of edges. I know it's on the thing, and this is the number of nodes. Then this is the average degree, right? So these are just some simple things. That's a sad K. Sad K. Okay. Cool beans. Uh, calligraphic N, sometimes we'll use that. That's the set of I's, um, KI neighbors, right? So node I uh, has this many friends. Degree we'll usually use as K, right? K will be a standard kind of notation for it. 
I mean, this is not you know, my choice necessarily, but it's just sort of to try and connect with the literature pretty well. And so there's a set of neighbors, right? So we'll be interested in things like, uh, you know, what, what are your friends like compared to you? What are your friends of friends like? How do you search through these networks? Right. And of course, what kinds of networks are there in the real world? This is, again, a very simple thing, but this is usually the story. You use a uh, sparse matrix to represent, as an adjacency matrix to represent connections. So this would be, um, <coughs> This is a, a directed one, and this means that node i is connected to node j. So we could, we could do that. could just do it on the board, I guess. Yeah, let's do it on the board. So this would be, you could think about how does this work. Simple thing. So uh, node 1, so we read across here, right? Node 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So no self-loops. I mean, you can have those things, depending on your network, but no self-loops uh, going across here. So 1, right? So this is node 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And uh, so there are links going from 1 to 2, 3, and 4. And then we read across the next, next line. So 2 is connected to 3 and 5. Again, it's directed, basic things. Uh, three is connected to one, so it's got a reciprocal, so we could just do it like this. Uh, four is connected to two and five. Four is connected to, right, there's this one back here. And then five is connected to two and four. All right, fine. So this one goes this way and this way. All right, so this is... There, this is partly, you know, storage on a computer. You might want this, or you could have some list of edges. It's often easy to do that as well. Uh, but there are also some, then there is a whole world of graph theory and linear algebra uh, that you can use, right? So if you wanted to, uh, we'll get to this maybe, well, in complex networks for sure. You can have, say, um, a vector here, and that could be, say, we've got a one and then all zeros. And that would represent the population of random walkers at node one. So we could imagine we put a whole bunch of little random walkers here. And then you can use these kinds of matrices to let them walk around by repeatedly multiplying by that matrix. So it's a diffusion process and we can think about the long-term behavior, which will mean eigenvalues and good things like that. Okay. Right, so storage and so on. And if you want to, I mean, so, so these cal calculations that you might want to, so you might want to compute average degree for the Facebook graph or the average distance between any two random people on Facebook, right? So that's hard. That's a hard thing to do. Um, so there are issues with actual massive computations as well. Average distance from you to a, a bot. Okay. So what's uh, so so you know what is what do we sort of mean by complex networks? So generally speaking, this is sort of the you know the rough kind of outlines of things. Um, large, right? They're large, and, and you know I'm going to say these loosely, right? Large. Um, they're sparse. This is almost always the case, right? So it's a low edge to node ratio. So you know the average degree of a node will be you know, nothing crazy. It won't be bazillions or anything like that. Because um, usually we're talking about networks of interacting agents that, that, you know, have cognitive loads or whatever it is. There's some burden to them. They're not connected to everyone. I mean, think of organizations, right? Think of the military. So the military struggled with this for a long time. Think about organizational structure. And, you know, in principle, they, with, with technology, you could connect everyone to everyone. But that's clearly not good. Uh, so there's usually some dynamic aspect to them involving, again, these are, these are pieces that only in the last, I would say, like five or six years have, have uh, th has there been a lot of headway with that. Um, all sorts of things. Networks can be all sorts of things, right? So uh, you can, you know, take some system and, and, and see the network structure in it. Right? It could be a, a thesaurus, for example, right? That's a, that gives you connection between words based on meanings and so on. 
All right, so I was just going to sort of go through what I'll give you as three main categories. None of these things will be super surprising, but these have all been pretty well studied now. Um, obviously, brain networks are uh, you know, incredibly hard to work with, so that's, that's going to take a long time. Um, <coughs> this is an early version of the web. Of course, um, you know, leaves, lots of interesting things in leaves and so on. It's a 2D structure, obviously. Um, river network structures. So these are things that are, you know, there's a distribution aspect to them. So river networks, you can think of them as having, you know, one output point and then it's a whole big sort of 2D um, air basin that's being drained. We can think of ourselves, right? We have a, a heart distributing to a three-dimensional body. So it's sort of a point source, broadly speaking, to a three-dimensional body and then we have to bring it all back uh, through the arterial and then the venal networks, slightly different structures. Uh, <coughs> you know, and it matters if it's in 3D or 2D and all these sorts of things. All right, so that's clearly all sitting around there. Power grids, obviously a big deal. Interaction networks. So these, you know, the blogosphere, right? So, and I sort of keep this here, but it, that's, that's waned in, uh, you know, kind of importance, really being killed by Facebook and Twitter and so on. Uh, but there are sort of biochemical networks, gene protein networks, right? I mean, trying to understand. You know, this is one of these early uh, great examples of complex systems where we just didn't at least collectively sort of say the right things, you know, about what the gene project or the genome project would produce. Obviously, incredibly important, but um, to, to get out the sort of basic elements of everything. Uh, but then there are all these interactions between genes, between genes and proteins. and pro so. You know, that takes a long, long time to, for us to document. You know, when we start to think of very complex diseases, many genes involved. Good. Food webs, so these are interesting ones. A little hard to get to a big data story, but, you know, one way, I guess, is anyone who's an ecologist who works on these things? Yeah? It's a little, right? I mean, food webs, lots of graduate students watching who ate whom. Right. What did you have for breakfast? Yeah, right. So a little invasive, you know, and uh, not so good for satellites, right? Yeah. But I mean, ecology has some other, th like forests or whatever, you can just go take pictures. Um, isn't there tracer stuff you put into the system yeah, to see? Um, uh, okay. Where you are on them. Yeah. The trough. I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about wh how far this will go, right? Like, could it really get to uh, like a massive big data remote? Because you, you get to remote sensing, right? It's always about remote sensing. Can you remotely sense things? Or do you need a graduate student with gloves on and a... Right, yeah, they're pretty messy, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Of course, we have the idea it's going to be some nice hierarchy, maybe, right? Yeah. <laughs> the vegetarians mess it all up. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty weird, right? You've got whales running around eating, you know, the tiniest, yeah. yeah. So it's not a simple, simple, um, you know, this fish gets eaten by this fish. That, like that, that's a nice, that's an easy thing to think about. Um, the web, the World Wide Web, it's a funny thing. So they're kind of interaction. Airline networks, these are adaptable things, right? They're not fixed. Um, call networks. So this is an interesting example where the data did exist. These guys had this data before 98. You know, they, they were sitting on this and didn't really, I don't know if, what, I mean, there were very famous people, mathematicians in there. I don't quite know why, I don't know what happened. They didn't really say, oh, you know, here's a picture of this. Maybe they couldn't do it for, um, I really don't know. I really don't know. Like, it was sitting there. They had these massive data sets that they could have worked on. I didn't quite say this before, but those papers are 98 and 99. They're working on them through 95, 96, 97 to get them done. You know, and the web starts in 92, right? So this is, yeah. This, this idea that data takes off at a particular point in time in the history of humanity makes sense. Um, was accessible, yeah. 
I know I've shown this one before, but this is a nice, you know, now we and it points to one other aspect too, right? So this is um, the adjacency of products, right? So if you make, if you pr export bananas, then there are these other products that countries who also export bananas tend to, or tropical agriculture tend to also export. So that's what this network's derived, how it's built. Um, you know, and this is sort of a fringe thing and it takes a while if you, if you evolve as a country, in, in industry-wise, then eventually maybe you get into here, which is a lot of tech stuff. Um, this, also, this, you know, this network is a very specially, you know, artistically rendered one, actually, right? Because there are all these other connections that have been thrown out. There's sort of a thresholding that's done to make it look okay. And we like it. There's nice little stories, some graphics. But the truth is most networks of any size are a horrible mess. Right, so we tend not to actually look at them. You know, it's a great show if you can make something like this, but we tend not to really plot them. We try; we have all sorts of things to do it, but we tend not to. Okay, this is uh, this is Peter Bamman, who's at uh, Columbia. Um, snogging means kissing. Um, so friendships, uh, acquaintances, boards, right? So these are human things, right? I used years ago, I had MySpace here. Uh, so this is actually a paper from a high school. It's about a high school in. Um, the Midwest, you know, unnamed high school, uh, Sunnydale High School or something like that, right? It's given some in quotes. And this is over a six-month period of, you know, who dated whom, basically, right? <laughs> Humans love this sort of thing. And then you see, there's six, I think that's 63. So there's 63 little uh, pairs by themselves, right? So it means that, you know. And then a few others like this, they're a little more complicated. And then you look at this and you think, you know, it's sort of the natural thing when you show this picture is this is like a disease disaster situation, you stop it, you know, you bad people. But if, you know, what's, what's not here and what is, you know, should be just completely obvious is that this is, this is a collapsed network, right? This is a collapse over, I think, six months. Yeah, six months. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, so, so it's very, it, 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 it misrepresents to you what could happen on such a network. Um, which we've known for a long time, and I'll, I guess I'll mention it again because it's sort of a ridiculous thing to sort of have to say, but it's now classified as temporal networks, right? And people are thinking about these things in, in uh, stronger ways, I guess, at least analytically. <coughs> the big developments have been temporal networks recently. I mean, it's just, of course, and um, uh, multi, multi-scale networks or multi-layered networks, networks that are bridged with other networks for whatever reason. It could be the power grid and a communication system or, you know, maybe the gas lines and uh, road systems and so on. Like, how are those things connected with each other? <coughs> and of course, you know, how do we get this data? Well, remote sensing, right, is the, is the transition from data scarce to data rich. Um, there are lots of ways to get these things. Of course, companies have this data and they love to, to look at it. Um, there's some work that we've been able to do over the years, I mean, some that I've been involved in, some that others have been involved in, of course, um, where you've been able, we've been able to get some of this data. For Columbia, for example, we got emails over a four-year period between people, but it was all anonymized and all the content was taken away. So you know, that was able to show you who contacted whom, and then there was anonymization of classes they were involved in and so on. So you can see the sort of co-evolution of friendships and the venues in which those people interacted and where they lived and so on. You know, that work keeps going. Um, Twitter has given us something. Facebook is closed. It's hard to get the Facebook data. Um, hard for them to get the data, I think. Uh, so, that's, so that's this one. Jefferson, Jefferson High School. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Okay, okay. Relation, relation in there. So, so, um, um, these, these, these are past, 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 Famously, there's a massive part of that. The Target, the Target, and Walmart have their own data science groups now. Um, there's a former postdoc who's associated with us, who was in uh, Weather and Climate, who works for Target now in data science. There are, I, I don't know if they're called Wall Labs, but you know these guys even have their own thing out in Silicon Valley. Uh, <coughs> and they respond to 
Uh, you know, they, they use this to do sort of basic things like you know, an old story for Walmart was that when hurricanes came through, they would look at what people bought before them, and then before the next one, they would you know, supply, right? So you'd think it would be, what would you think, like sandbags and so on? But apparently, Pop-Tarts were a huge thing. So, so, you know, Walmart would start, you know, just like ants, like building up their little things before the rain comes, you know, like shoring it all up. Stock marks, uh, you know, Walmart's shoring up the, uh, the Pop-Tarts. Okay. So, you know, well done, humans. Anyway, uh, this is the, these are relational networks. So we went from these sort of physical ones to interactional type ones, which still have physical things. And then ones that start to become much more, you know, there really isn't, there can be physical, in, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of money involved with this. There are physical places. You know, this becomes more, more abstract. We have some work that hopefully we'll get to be able to do in January on the um, uh, Oxford uh, English thesaur the thesaurus, the historical thesaurus going back a thousand years. Um, so, the, you know, really interesting. And this remains a huge, huge thing. News and knowledge. How do we do this well? That is, well, if you want to make a lot of money, there's a lot of money in that field going ahead. Okay, so we're going to run out of time. Sorry. What happened? Yeah, it is, right? So um, you, can, you can watch this while this. Yeah, so from a modeling point of view, yeah, that's, um, this is just a whole um, Yeah, so you, and, and so like Puma, right? Puma took off in the 90s, no, in the 2000s. And then everyone started wearing Puma. So they respond and they make every possible thing they can. And then of course people buy it. So the study of that is pretty, uh, incredibly interesting, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> this is all this is, by the way. It's good. It's supposed to make you feel better after this. Um, but it's true. And so Harry Potter comes out, right? And then suddenly everyone, all the publishers, want a book like that. So they, and they start to publish books like that. And they're terrible. Because they're just like, one of those. Because they don't know, right? They don't know. No one, yeah. Not obvious. Are right, you free to go just like this dog is free to go? Enjoy the cold fall that we are going to have. Are you having fun? <laughs>